very rational Marie Curie. Uh, draw up a list of the most brilliant people that you know have walked the earth. Now draw up a second list, the ones with the Nobel Prize. And now draw up a third list with the ones who have a second Nobel Prize. And Marie Curie would be on that list, and perhaps quite likely to be on the top of that list. But when the heart is lost, even the brainiest of brains, they may not be able to come to its rescue. Marie had been captivated by science from the time she was born. It was hardly a surprise then that she found love in Pierre Curie, a brilliant scientist himself. They were best friends, lovers, and scientific collaborators. But a sudden accident snatched Pierre away from Marie, and she was plunged into grief. For four years, she stayed walled in behind her pain, mourning the loss of her best friend and lover. But in the spring of 1910, her friends noticed a change in her appearance. Her demeanor had lightened. She looked happy, a little too happy. She had met someone, Paul Langevin, a former student of her husband. Over the years, an intimacy developed between them. They taught together, she spent time with his family, and eventually he began confiding in her about his unhappy marriage. A romantic entanglement between the two began. Paul and Marie would meet, meet secretly in an apartment. They called it Our Place. Shenu. In one letter, Marie writes of the delicious memory of their time together. I still see your good and tender eyes, your charming smile. But this blissful time was not to be. Paul's wife, Jean, soon became suspicious. Possessed with a violent temper, she made threats to kill Marie. She accosted her in the streets. That summer, Marie took her children on a holiday to Brittany Coast. From there, she wrote a long letter to Paul, in which she encouraged him to separate from his wife. This letter is one of persuasion, in which Marie fights for her lover's commitment. La Cruz, Brittany, late summer 1910. It would be good to gain freedom to see each other as much as our various occupations permit to work together, to walk or to travel together when conditions lend themselves. There are very deep affinities between us which only need a favorable life situation to develop. We had some presentiment of it in the past, but it didn't come into full consciousness until we found ourselves face to face. The instinct which led us to each other was very powerful since it helped us to overcome so many unfortunate impressions about this very different way in which each of us had understood, organized our private life. What couldn't come out of this feeling? Instinctive and spontaneous and so compatible with our intellectual needs to which it seems so admirably adapted. I believe that we could derive everything from it. Good work in common, a good solid friendship, courage for life, and even beautiful children of love in the most beautiful meaning of the word. Your wife is incapable of remaining tranquil and allowing you your freedom. She will try always to exercise a constraint over you for all sorts of reasons material interests, desire to distract herself, and even simple idleness. Don't forget either that you have constant disagreements about the education of the children or the life of the household. A stable regime based on reciprocal liberty, making it possible for the children to have an atmosphere in which they could breathe, will never exist in your house. If she committed herself to it, she would never be able to keep her promise. Being too violent and too used to getting her way by violent means, then also too crude and too devoid of scruples to understand the harm she is doing to her children. Even leaving the children as long as they are young, principally with their mother and her family, would be less bad than the continual example of a family in a state of war. 
if the separation took place, your wife would very quickly stop paying attention to her children, who she is capable of guiding and who bore her. And you could take up little by little the preponderant direction. Finally, my Paul, there are not only your children to consider, there is you, your future as a scientist, your moral and intellectual life, all that has been in great danger for some years. All your friends know it, even if they don't know the reasons. All those who love you have been worried about your state for years. Your students at the college speak with uneasiness of your visible fatigue for whatever reason. You must realize that. You can neither live nor breathe nor work in the atmosphere which you're in. You haven't been able to work recently except when your wife was in the hospital. Your family is a milieu of irresistible destructive power and I believe altogether exceptional. You can't live in this family without being manipulated by it to its own purpose. Contrary even to the interest of this family, which should value you more than it does. Even your children become in this group an instrument of your oppression and not at all in relation to their mother who is too much of an egoist to allow herself to be exploited. It is certain that your wife will not readily accept a separation because she has no interest in it. She's always lived by exploiting you and will not find that situation as advantageous. What's more, it is in her character to stay when she thinks that you would like her to go. It is therefore necessary for you to decide, no matter how difficult that is for you, to do all that you can methodically to make her life insupportable first time she proposes that she could allow you to separate while keeping the children. You must accept without hesitation to cut short the blackmail that she will attempt on this subject. We could maintain the same precautions we do now for seeing each other until the situation becomes stable. Paul, but when I know that you are with her, my nights are atrocious. I, I can't sleep. I manage with great difficulty to sleep two or three hours. I wake up with a sensation of fear. I can't work. Do what you can to be done with it. Don't, don't ever come down unless she, she comes to look for you. Work late. As for the pretext that you were looking for, tell her that working late and rising early, you absolutely have need of rest in order to be able to do your work. And that her request of a common bed unnerves you and makes it impossible for you to have a real rest and that if you perhaps had given in during the holidays you refuse absolutely to continue and that if she insists you will stay in Paris with John do that my Paul I beg of you and don't let yourself be touched by a crisis of crying and tears. Think of the saying about the crocodile who cries because he has not eaten his prey. The tears of your wife are of this kind. It is necessary, absolutely, that she understands that she can expect nothing from you. When she has understood, she will no longer be unhappy since you will give her the means to live largely as she pleases. She will be able then to look for pleasure and affection elsewhere and find it. Goodbye, my Paul. I embrace you with all my tenderness. I will try to return to work, even though it is difficult when the nervous system is so strongly stirred up. I await the joy of seeing you with impatience. Matters escalated very quickly. Jean hired a detective who stole the letters Marie had written to Paul. On the verge of once again losing the man she loved, Marie was close to a breakdown. She was attending a prestigious physics conference in Brussels when she received two telegrams. One informed her that she had won the second Nobel Prize. The other, that Jean had made her love letters public. 
Marie returned to France immediately. The press had branded her a homewrecker and a stone-throwing mob greeted her. Friends discouraged her from attending the Nobel Prize ceremony, but she did collect it on the insistence of Albert Einstein. The romance, though between herself and Paul, did not recover from this period of strain. They remained friends 